Hello, my name is Ken Wright. This presentation will be discussing nucleosynthesis, the current theory dealing with the creation of the elements. Nucleosynthesis is the process by which the elements are created in the heat of stars. And we will be discussing one of the elements, that of carbon. Nucleosynthesis is a complex subject, but I will be simplifying the concepts to get the main point across, namely that the creation of carbon is a virtual miracle of design. Carbon is the most versatile of all the elements. It combines with other elements in millions of ways. And strictly on its own, it comes in various forms in the way its atoms can connect with each other in different configurations. The pictures on this screen are all pictures of carbon of different crystal structures called allotropes. But I don't want to discuss further the amazing properties of carbon because I want to stick to the main point of this presentation, namely the absolute miracle of how carbon is created. This chart is called the periodic table of the elements and versions of this can be found on walls of every chemistry lab or classroom around the world. Carbon is the sixth element on this chart. Is carbon being made by our sun? No, not yet, but in time it will. Presently, our sun is burning or fusing hydrogen to create helium. Let's walk through this process. It is a good example of the way that the elements are created. This is the hydrogen atom, the lightest and simplest of all the elements. It consists of one electron having a negative charge, orbiting a nucleus of a single proton having a positive charge. If two hydrogen nuclei come together in the heat and pressure of a star such as our sun, they can fuse together, creating a new single nucleus, namely the nucleus of deuterium. This is the fusion process. Deuterium consists of one electron orbiting a nucleus of one proton and one neutron. Deuterium is also hydrogen, but is called heavy hydrogen because of the extra particle in its nucleus. This is called an isotope. A neutron is a particle with no charge. But where did the neutron come from? It is created in a process called reverse beta decay. When the two hydrogen nuclei fuse together, one of the protons decays into a neutron. But how does that proton lose its charge to become a neutron? Well, the proton radiates away a particle called a positron. A positron is the exact opposite of an electron. Instead of an electron with a negative charge, it is an electron with a positive charge, or positron. So, we have two hydrogen nuclei fusing together to create a deuterium nucleus. If we fuse together two deuterium nuclei, we get a helium nucleus. This is the basic process of how the higher level elements are created from lower level elements. But there's a pretty strict rule. The energy levels of the fusing nuclei must resonate with the energy level of the new nucleus to be created. This is called nuclear resonance. Nuclear reactions are said to be resonant if the sum of the energies of the incoming reacting particles is very close to the natural energy level of a new, heavier nucleus. 
So, our sun is creating helium by burning hydrogen. But when will it start to create carbon? This will happen when most of the hydrogen is used up billions of years from now. At this point, it will begin to burn the helium and the sun will swell to a huge size, becoming what is called a red giant. In this picture, the little white circle in the middle is our sun at its present size. This will be our sun after the hydrogen is gone. So our sun will begin to burn helium. Helium will fuse to create beryllium. Helium will fuse again with beryllium to create carbon. Here is how it works. Two helium nuclei, each with two protons and two neutrons, fuse together to create a beryllium nucleus consisting of four protons and four neutrons. If we then take another helium nucleus and fuse it with the beryllium nucleus, we get a carbon nucleus. This is called the triple alpha process because the helium nuclei are called alpha particles. But wait a minute, there is something terribly wrong here. The energy levels of the two lower nuclei do not resonate with the base carbon nucleus. The base carbon nucleus energy is too low. There shouldn't be any carbon produced from such a fusion. So how does carbon ever get produced? This was a huge puzzle and problem for physicists. Well, enter Fred Hoyle. Besides being an astronomer, a cosmologist, an astrophysicist, he was also a committed atheist and he was a prime developer of the nucleosynthesis theory. Fred thought about the carbon creation problem a lot. He reasoned that since we're here, because we're made of carbon, and it is so plentiful everywhere, there must be a way. He decided that there had to be an excited state of carbon that matches the resonance requirements of the lower nuclei. Well, Fred badgered the powers that be at Caltech, where he was a visiting professor, until they finally acquiesced to utilize their particle accelerator to test his crazy theory. He turned out to be exactly right. There is an excited state of carbon that matches the resonance requirements of the lower nuclei. Fred predicted 7.65 million electron volts. The actual value was measured at 7.656 million electron volts. Almost exactly the number that matched Fred's prediction. So there is an excited state of carbon, but this excited state rapidly decays never making it to ground state. It is estimated that out of 10,000 fusions, only four drop down to stable carbon. And yet, with such a poor showing, there is still lots of carbon. Fred was stunned by this. Think about it. If the excited state of carbon produces such a tiny percentage of successful carbon and it's still so plentiful. What if the base state of carbon resonated with the lower level nuclei? Practically the whole universe would be nothing but carbon. Instead of 
out of 10,000 fusions becoming stable carbon, all of the fusions would become stable. Then instead of carbon being the fourth most abundant element, it would be almost the only element. Then other critical elements required for life would be non-existent. None of the heavier elements would ever be created. Fred saw this as a built-in stopping mechanism designed by God to prevent carbon from dominating the universe. He was converted. At a later time in life, he stated, Our own measure of intelligence must reflect higher intelligences, even to the limit of God. This is so obvious that one wonders why it is not widely accepted as being self-evident. The reasons are psychological rather than scientific. 